Hey everybody, welcome to CAF Warbird Tube, the show where we talk about World War II, aviation, history, and so much more. Warbird Tube is produced by the Commemorative Air Force, the world's largest flying museum. Our mission is to educate, inspire, and honor through flight and living history experiences. The CAF began the Warbird Movement more than 65 years ago, and thanks to the support of individuals like you, we continue to grow strong. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and now our host, Steve Buss. Thanks for watching and keep them flying. Good evening and welcome to CAF Warbird Tube. This is episode number 154 of Warbird Tube and tonight we're going to take a look at the Missouri Wings B-25 Mitchell. It's going to take center stage and we'll talk about the history of the B-25, a little bit about the wing, but most importantly, the new coat of paint that's going on the airplane right now for the 2024 air show season. So we'll get into that with Rob Jenner in just a moment. But before we get started, please do us a favor. If you haven't already done so, please take a second to share, like, or subscribe and follow us. <clears throat> and if you do subscribe on YouTube, click that bell icon and you'll get new notifications uh, about Warbird Tube when we post our new shows. Warbird Tube is made possible by the Commemorative Air Force. To find out more about CAF, our events, our aircraft, local units, or how you can be a part of the fun, visit our website, commemorativeairforce.org. Now, as you're watching tonight, you may have some questions about the B-25 or the Missouri Wing or CAF in general. Just type those in the question box. We'll try to answer them either during the show or before we sign off tonight. So joining me from the uh, St. Louis, Missouri area, Rob Jenner, who is the uh, leader of the Missouri Wing. Rob, great to have you on the show tonight. Thanks for having us, Steve, and thanks for inviting the Missouri Wing on the uh, show this evening. Well, uh, before we talk about the airplane, and we know everybody wants to talk about the airplane, but we want to talk about you first. Tell us a little bit about uh, your background and how you got to be the wing leader of the uh, Missouri Wing. Well, in short, I uh, I started off. Uh, uh, St. Louis boy by uh, uh, birth and got raised here and I uh, started off, uh, I flew in the uh, Missouri Air Guard. I was a backseater in F-4s with the Air Guard and then subsequent to that, I uh, spent a long career flying in corporate, uh, corporate aviation. Uh, I retired from uh, flying in 2019 and uh, shortly after that, I uh, uh, made my way out to the uh, Missouri wing out at Smart Field. So prior to that, uh, uh, fellow that I was flying with who was a member of the Syntex wing, he he kept, uh, we were flying in Austin and he kept uh, urging me to go down and, and join the Syntex wing and join the CAF. And, uh, you know, being from St. Louis was a little tough, but then he reminded me there was a wing here in St. Louis. So I went out and visited them and joined them in uh, 2019 and uh, have been with them since and uh, took over the, uh, stepped into the leadership role about a year and a few months ago uh, out at the wing. So it's been a great ride. How's it going so far? So far, so good. It's a, uh, you know, it's an interesting, you meet, uh, I got to meet, uh, you know, it, it, the part of the CAF that's kind of neat is you meet people from all different walks that uh, as we go through long careers and are, are kind of siloed in what we do, uh, the CAF allows us to meet some new people and people with different uh, backgrounds, different skills. So it's it's been a lot of fun. It's a great group out here in Missouri, a long time group. Uh, so it's been very enjoyable. Yeah, I was going to mention that uh, the Missouri wing is one of the uh, longest tenured wings in CAF. Uh, been around for quite a while, very successful. Um, describe where Smart Field is in relationship to St. Louis, because it's a, St. Louis, if you've never been there, is like a lot of big cities kind of sprawling and there are a number of airports, but kind of describe where, uh, where you're located. Well, indeed. So if you look at the picture here of uh, Show Me Going By The Arch, if you go west, northwest, about 20 miles, out in St. Charles County, uh, up near the confluence of the Mississippi, the Missouri, and the Illinois, you'll find Smart Field. Uh, Smart Field was a auxiliary airfield of Naval Air Station St. Louis uh, at the beginning of the war, and the field was used to train steerman pilots. So uh, if you come out, it's the original Quonset-shaped uh, uh, historic wooden hangar uh, at Smart Field, and uh, so it's been there uh, since the beginning of the war. Uh, it's named after uh, an Ensign Smart, who was the first um, resident of St. Charles County who was killed in a war, uh, was killed at Pearl Harbor. So um, that's where we live. It's about 20 miles, like I said, northwest of St. Louis, uh, kind of out in the farmland, but it's a great place to have an airport and a great place to fly. 
And you mentioned the, the the confluence of the rivers that kind of came to to uh, bite the wing in the backside uh, a number of years ago. <laughs> it has bitten the wing of several times. So uh, of course the the uh, great flood of 1993, we had I think there was probably 12 or 13 feet of water yeah. in there for quite a while. Our last one was 2019. Uh, we had. Uh, roughly 40 inches of water in the hangars, and we were out of the facility for the better part of a year and a half, um, redoing it and rebuilding. So uh, the rivers are always there. Uh, Mother Nature, as they say, bats last, so uh, we do our best to prepare for it. So you can, as you can imagine, everything at the wing is on wheels and uh, <laughs> ready to bug out if we have to. There you so. go. All right, well, let's talk about something a little little more fun, and that is the uh, the B-25 that we know as Show Me. But um, sure. Talk a little bit about the history of the airplane before it came to the wing. So um, if you look back in the history of the V-25, back before the war, the World War II started, uh, North American began the design of an airplane that was initially uh, designed for the British and the French, and it was going to be offered as an option for them. Uh, both countries selected a different airplane, and um, at the outbreak of the war, then the B-25 became of more necessity. Unlike a lot of other airplanes that you see, there was very little development program in the B-25. They built an initial uh, copy of the airplane and it pretty much went into production from there. There was not a long test program as you would see, so a little unique in that, that it didn't have a long test program. Um, the original model was an NA-40-1, looked quite a bit different from the B-25 we're familiar with today. Uh, it was designed um, by a team led by uh, a guy named Dutch Kindleberger, who was a very famous uh, North American designer who was also responsible for designing the, the, the Mustang B-51. So uh, the airplane was sort of went into production very quickly and most of the modifications and changes to the airplane were done either on the assembly line or in the field. Uh, it started with uh, Pratt & Whitney engines and eventually evolved into the R2600s that we know of today, the 1700 horsepower uh, Wright Cyclone engines. And the, the gull wing that everybody is familiar with, that wasn't on the original airplane either. And that was added at a later date to help with which was uh, with a, a nasty Dutch roll tendency in the airplane. Um, the airplane started its production life in California, but most of them were, were produced in the Fairfax factory in Kansas City. All in all, uh, 9,816 airplanes were produced, uh, the model, and at one point they were rolling out uh, 10 airplanes a day, which if you think of the 1940s and the industrial, uh, that's, that's quite a feat to come out with 10 airplanes a day, and it reminds us that the you know, it was not only the fighting might of the United States, but it was the industrial might of the United States that uh, helped with that. So uh, it went on to serve with uh, the British, the French, the Chinese, the Dutch, uh, several uh, countries flew the airplane in the war. Even uh, I read where the little African country of Biafra had two of them that they used during their civil war. So served a, a lot of uh, with a lot of countries. Uh, Show Me um, was, the manufacturing was at the end of 1944. It was delivered to the Army Air Force in June of 1945. Uh, after delivery, uh, it went, it, uh, went uh, to uh, Yuma for a bit, then Williams Air Force Base, and then ended up at Mather Air Force Base in Sacramento. Um, where it was a, a became a navigator trainer, so it's a little close to my heart, having went through Mather through navigator school as well. Uh, it uh, stayed in in Mather and in um, about 1957, it went to Hayes in Birmingham, where it was modified and changed into a TB25N. Uh, from there, it went to McDill for more to serve as a pilot trainer uh, there. Uh, finally to Davis-Monthan, where it served for a little bit and was finally struck off the rolls in 1959. And that began the civilian life of the airplane. And it went through several owners in Illinois and Wisconsin. 
and ended up with uh, finally with Jack Rhodes in Seymour, Illinois, uh, where it stayed. It was damaged in a storm and was um, uh, angered and, and went through storage uh, for a number of years. And they had to take a nose off of a scrapped B-29 or B-25 to replace this airplane. Um, it stayed with them in, in 1982. It was purchased by a group called, um, called Air Classics, which was about 20 guys in St. Louis that pooled their money and bought the airplane. And um, in 1984, it was officially donated to the CAF and began its life as Show Me with the CAF. Sure. Uh, but the B-25, um, it uh, about 53 feet long, about 68 uh, foot wingspan, 17 feet high. So it's a medium sized airplane. Um, it's a it's a great airplane to fly. It's it's a very easily handling air handling airplane, and so it was a very successful bomber um, during the war. Sure. As you know, it started out uh, the the South Pacific group started in Port Moresby, and the airplane evolved from a level flight bomber, and with the additions of uh, more armament and more guns, became quite a lethal strafer. And at one time, you know, there were fourteen forward facing 50 caliber guns uh, that powered the airplane, so. Yeah, quite uh, quite the firepower. Now the, uh, the slide we're looking at now, this is a thing from the uh, late 90s, early 2000s. Um, so it's it's with the uh, it's with Missouri Wing at this point. Um, it is. Which looks, looks a little different than, than we see the airplane today. It does, and that, um, that, that picture was taken. This was a, uh, a big open house. It's at Lambert Field. It's at the, uh, it's on the ramp of the 131st TAC Fighter Wing of the Missouri Air National Guard. And you can see by this picture that the markings are minimal on it. There is, uh, we don't have the nose art on it. It does have the Apache, uh, the 345th uh, Bombardment uh, Group Apache on the tail. But a lot of the markings, uh, you're right, are absent yet. And those evolved as we went on uh, before it had the, the nose art and before it had the show me name. Uh, so that was earlier on in the early 90s, yeah. And when did the uh, when did the top turret come on? The top turret uh, was, uh, if if I have my dates correct, it was late in the 90s when that top turret was installed. And uh, you'll see also on this one, the forward, the uh, guns and the nose are not there yet. Uh, so those were all um, later additions. The, uh, the 50 calibers guns, uh, not only in the nose, but on the uh, the, uh, the packs on the side were added later. And on our current, those are all, they're all real guns. They're inert, of course, but they're all real guns. And uh, there are several good stories about the uh, guys that went and fetched these guns, I think down somewhere in Alabama or Mississippi, and, and we're driving home with 14 or 15 50 caliber machine guns in the car. And uh, we're worried about being pulled, <laughs> being pulled over at that time for something. So uh, the nice evolution of the airplane to what it's ended up today. So. Well, and and I, I love this picture too. Being being a student of history, when you look at the airplanes that are behind it, uh, absolutely, <laughs> you get some uh, some pretty good looking hardware back there. Yeah, and that ramp actually is is in the general same area where Naval Air Station St. Louis was. Okay. During the war, which then translated out to the Ox Field out at Smart Field. So, yeah, pretty awesome. And big crowd with the C-130, as always. Indeed, yeah. <laughs> Here we go. Now we're moving up in uh, its history a little bit. Uh, we've got the uh, the nose art. Right. So the first iteration of the nose art on there and show me. Um, uh, this was probably, well, it's the same, same air show. So during that, uh, or a later air show rather. So during that time in between those two, the nose art was added. Um, and um, show me was added there and then it it changed and you'll see as it evolved where uh, some of the benefactors of the airplane earlier on were, were added underneath the window. We also added some mission information, not for this particular airframe, but as a representative of the, five, the, three, uh, the 345th and the 501st uh, Bombardment Squadron. Uh, so those were added as the, as as we added history to the airplane as it okay. showed. And 
I would think that the name Show Me comes from Missouri being the Show Me State. The or is state there some of, other some the other show, no, behind the that? Show Me State? That is it. <laughs> okay. All right, so we're we're seeing the the original nose art and the nose art as it is um, more currently. And this was uh, Gary current. Velasco uh, did this a couple of years ago for you. Yes, Gary Velasco did this artwork. He came in and uh, uh, I, I say touched her up, but he really redid the whole nose art on there. And as we get into the paint job a little later, this blue outline that you see around here becomes very important when we get to our current paint job, as he's pointing out. So the names under there are, are earlier uh, part of the group of 20 that originally bought it. Uh, we have a, a, um, uh, a current um, benefactor who has endowed money and his uncle uh, flew the airplane. So uh, it is a tribute to the, the, the guys who were instrumental in bringing the airplane to St. Louis and to the CAF and to those who have helped us uh, continue that and go along. And we have a benefactor who is, he's expressed an interest. He wants to see our airplane flying when it's 100 years old. And so we're, it's a ways off, but we are committed to making that happen for him. And his uncle flew the airplane. So that was sort of his connection to the airplane. Very good, very good. And then uh, obviously striking nose art, but also the uh, the, the tail art uh, as well. Right. Very, very, uh, very striking. It is. So that is the, the 345th, Bombardment Group, the Air Apaches, and as I mentioned, there were there were four uh, squadrons: the uh, 498th, 499th, 500, and 501st. And they were distinguished by the you could tell by the color of the uh, beauty rings on the engines, different colors. And so we are representing the 501st uh, squadron of the Air Apaches, and that group was, as I mentioned, they. Um, Originally, when they were stood up, uh, they were intended to go, the, the 345th was intended to go to Europe, uh, but a last minute change sent them to the South Pacific. Uh, they made the trek down there and they, they started their campaign in Port Moresby. Uh, okay. And the 345th marched their way across the Pacific through the Solomons, through uh, the Philippines, and eventually on to Japan. And you know, I, I went and looked at a few numbers, and, and the 345th, they flew 58,000 combat hours over 10,600 missions. Um, they, uh, there were 177 planes lost and a total of 580 men lost in this campaign. Uh, one of the more decorated units during the war, and at the end of the war, they were selected, uh, the, the, uh, Bombardment wing escorted two uh, Japanese Betty bombers that carried the surrender party uh, to the surrender ceremony. So they they were in there as they campaigned across there, and they were there when it uh, when it came to a conclusion. So and shortly after the war, the uh, uh, 345th was stood down, and and uh, and they were ultimately resurrected as a modern fighter day unit, but they were stood down from their wartime stuff just right after the war. So uh, we represent the Air Apaches and it's a it's a great history and, and the history of the 345th across the Pacific is really interesting. Awesome. Um, as I said in the beginning, if you have any questions, uh, just go ahead and type those in the uh, in the question box. Uh, Dennis McElroy, he's got a little trivia question for you. We'll put you on the spot. Uh, do you oh, know boy. about how about how many B-25s are are still uh, out there? Uh, there is about so you hear a number that it it revolves around 45 flying. So okay. around the world, there are between at any given time roughly 43 to 45 still flying. Uh, I saw a number that said 170 still exist, uh, whether they're, you know, uh, gate guards, post airplanes, or in museums. So, but uh, uh, breathing, uh, smoking, uh, noise making, about 43 to 45 at any given time. And of course, the CAF has six of them, so we're right there with them. So. Good. Well, now, how many hours do you have flying the uh, the 25? Oh, I'm, I'm a pretty short timer. I'm probably up around 75 or 80 hours. I've only been flying it for the three or four years now. So, uh, but uh, as I mentioned to you when we were talking earlier, having come from mostly a jet career, it was uh, quite a bit of difference uh, climbing into an airplane at, with round motors and learning the new engines and the airplane. So, 
but a great airplane to fly. Yeah. Well, you get to you get to fly a little slower and a little lower than you did when you were in the uh, in the executive transports. Exactly. Indeed. Yeah. So. Uh, do you recall just a couple of because people are always interested. What what's your you know rotation speed, cruising speed, you know stall speed? So the airplane like, comes off the ground. Uh, it is uh, it comes off the ground around a hundred and between about a hundred and ten. And of course, with a lot of propeller airplanes, you want to get to the single engine safety speed of 145 as quickly as you can. And uh, uh, it cruises around 200 to 220, depending on the, so the power settings. Um, it, um, our, our range on the airplane, of course, we're not flying the airplane out to the maximum range, but uh, uh, we'll anywhere 300 mile range around St. Louis for air shows and um, and events like that is good. It's a, uh, as I said, it's a uh, for a sort of relatively big airplane. It's it's fairly light on the controls. Um, it's a it's a as, as the guys would say, it's a pilot's airplane. You have to fly the airplane, and uh, it, it takes some time to get used to. Uh, the nose steering is just castered. It's freewheeling, and uh, people will tell you it takes time to to get used to the brakes and get used to the handling. Uh, when they flew the airplane in the wartime, the weights were up in the high 30s, the mid to upper 30,000 pounds. Uh, most operators don't fly them that heavy right now. Uh, uh, the heavier weights are hard on the nose gear, so we keep the weights down uh, in the mid 20s uh, when we're flying. So, you mentioned the uh, the uh, cowlings on the engines. Uh, because mm -hmm. I was going to ask why the, the cowlings were uh, that color, that kind of orange. And that was the color of the uh, 501st. So. Uh, we've retained that with them, and uh, I, I don't remember the colors of the other squadrons, but there are various different colors to distinguish on the beauty rings on the engines. So it looks good. Now the uh, the wing itself, uh, you've got, uh, as we talked about a little bit, uh, some some great history, uh, but you were also part of the uh, the uh, Do Little Raid reunion a, a number of years ago. Yes, they've been to several of them. The previous picture you had. Uh, if you looked on the side of the pictures, you would see, um, and it's well, it's very difficult to see. Sorry about that. But in the bombs, you'll see the star, the red stars in some of the bombs, and those were the reunions that this airplane attended. Uh, so the big ones were uh, the 68th, uh, which was held in uh, 2010 at the Air Force Museum, and they had 17 uh, B-25s gathering for that. They had tried for 25, didn't quite make it uh, for that reunion. Then the 70th was held in 2012, and they had 20 of them there, which was the most uh, the most B-25s that in w any one time since the war. So they had them uh, again. That was at Wright Pat. Uh, the airplanes mustered at Grimes Field nearby for the practice and the rehearsal, and then they opened up the closed runway at Wright Pat uh, to allow the B-25s to get in there. So you can have a picture of that and the flyovers of the Air Force yeah. Museum there. Um, so those were, I wasn't in the unit at the time, of course, but uh, the, the guys that participated in that said that was just a spectacular time on that. And of course, the uh, last uh, Dulo reunion was the 71st, mm -hmm. uh, which was held in Fort Walton Beach, um, but there weren't any airplanes at that one. So the Dulo reunions were a great time, uh, great history. I, uh, uh, I was looking over the uh, goblet ceremony um, with the Dulo and, and how the goblets came in to be and you when you turned a goblet you could read the the raider's name upright or you could read it upside down uh once he had passed so uh yeah the airplanes participated the airplane participated in the do little reunions and uh the guys that participated in that uh, that's some of their favorite memories of being able to oh, i'm sure yeah and a spectacular photo i've never seen this this photo before with the just you'd start counting all the b25s that are that are in that making that flyover. It's uh, yeah, lots of B-25s. Huh? <laughs> and of course, uh, favorite uh, CAF guest, uh, Colonel McGee from the uh, McGee. Tuskegee Airmen. Um, yeah. Yeah, and it, it, it's a great story. Um, most of us have been history buffs. You know, to be into this, you're a history buff. Uh, but coming to the CAF and being able to dig down a little further, and he. He really is kind of one of the guys that you know you you consider one of your heroes. Um, you know, I think at the end uh, he had ended up with 409 combat missions 
through World War II in Korea and Vietnam. And after his uh, tour in Europe, of course, he went back to Tuskegee and was instructing in the B-25. So uh, the connection is there where he trained in that before he went off uh, for the Korean conflict. So it's a great story. And, and these guys, uh, several of which are still you know, with us in the unit, uh, got to spend time with, uh, well, then, you know, almost then General, well, Colonel McGee at that time. Right. So it was very, very neat, very much fun. And of course, speaking of fun, that's going to take us to uh, one of the events that the Missouri Wing is well known for, and that is your uh, fall pumpkin drop. Yes, our pumpkin drop. So uh, the pumpkin drop was originally started uh, at Smart Field uh, by our general a a aviation providers on the field. And it allowed uh, a general aviation pilot to, uh, it was for charity. So you, you essentially bought a pumpkin and you got to fly over the airport and they set up a, a target, which was a car or a, or a big X, and you got a chance to drop a, a pumpkin. So some years ago, the guys, the mechanically inclined guys in the uh, unit, they developed, um, I'm not sure what do you even call them, this gizmo that uh, went up in the bomb bay of the B-25, and it holds about uh, 16 to 18 pumpkins. Uh, and it holds them in such a way that we can make two passes and drop you know, half on each pass. So what we do is we, we go down the street to one of the farms and we buy up a load of pumpkins and the pumpkins are hollowed out. A hole is, punt is cut in the side and then it's filled with either blue chalk, red chalk or white chalk. And the lids are put on and they're put up in these containers. And in the middle of the day when the GA uh, folks are dropping a pumpkin, we close the airport and we go into wavered airspace and then the TBM and the B-25 take off for a little competition. And when the, when the pumpkins come out of the airplane, uh, that little hole in the side blows the lid off. So you have this nice trail of red, white, and blue chalk as it comes down to the target. It, it makes cheating difficult because we can see right where they're going. And so the, uh, the Air Force and the Navy have a competition on that day. So, uh, the Air Force, the Navy had a long run of victories. Uh, I will say the last two years, the Air Force has won the competition and uh, it draws great crowds and the people just love it. And it it is a, uh, it just becomes a fun event and you'll hear people say, are you going to go to the pumpkin drop? And, you know, what, well, what is this pumpkin drop? And they explain it to them. So uh, we get big crowds out there to watch the GA airplanes, but when the B-25 and the TBM uh, go so we're in wavered airspace so we're we're crossing over the airport a little lower and uh, we get to come in and, and make chalk mess on top of cars and and targets hopefully so it's a great event it's our end of it's uh, the end of the season event for us right. and it's it's a great way to cap off the year for us yeah. we well, you have several other events that that happen during the year you've got a hangar dance we're looking at uh, at here um, that uh, hangar dances at, at many CAF units have just become increasingly popular through the years. They are, they're fantastic. Uh, the same big band uh, sentimental journey has played at our hangar dances for uh, 25 plus years now. Uh, our hangar dance happens in September. And uh, uh, as you can see, it's, it's we have people who have been coming for 15 and 20 years. What we're encouraged by is the last couple of years, we've seen an uptick in the young people and that's um, you know, one of the goals and one of the challenges that we have is how do we attract, as we get further and further away from those years, uh, how do we attract these young people? So an uptick in the younger people coming has been really encouraged. And uh, we have, we started with a, uh, a little demonstration with the TBM and the B-25 to start the evening off. It's an evening of dancing and, and, and good music. Uh, we have a, a late glow where the airplanes start and, uh, you know, we, we make flames come out of the exhaust. And it's another one of those things people just love. They just love to see the airplanes and hear them at night. And uh, so the hangar dance is, is, is uh, our big event in the fall, our big fundraising event, and uh, is a very popular. And you can see the, uh, the James O. Holton uh, Heritage Hangar, the Holton family here in St. Louis, they are the ones that endowed our steermen. Their dad trained at this base uh, at the beginning of the war and went on to fly uh, Corsairs and had a, a great career. 
And so they uh, endowed this. And so we renamed this uh, hangar uh, for for Mr. Holton. And uh, uh, that's where we're at with that one. So Good. And you're at a couple of uh, air shows in the St. Louis area on an annual basis, aside from the ones that you do, um, you know, out tour. Sure. Uh, we have uh, this coming spring, of course, we're back to Spirit, the big Spirit air show, uh, which alternates with the show over at Scott Air Force Base every year. So we're back to uh, Spirit this year uh, for the show, and we will be there, and it's, it's looking to be a big, busy air show as well. Prior to that, on Memorial Day, we have our annual uh, Wings Over St. Louis event where we're it's just our unit, uh, and occasionally another CAF unit will bring their airplanes in too. And so that's our, our, our spring rides event over Memorial Day weekend at Spirit. So uh, we'll uh, give rides for the three-day Memorial Day weekend, and it's a great time a lot of people have plans over the Memorial Day weekend, but uh, they seem to find time to come out and look at the warbirds and uh, spend some time. So, you know, nothing nothing beats. Uh, museum airplanes are great. They're uh, asleep and they're a little cold and uh, nothing beats the noise and the sound. And, you know, occasionally a young kid will get a little hot oil dripped on him. He thinks it's the greatest thing in the world. So uh, we love it. It's great having them out. But, so do you, uh, with the TBM and the B-25, do you do a tour uh, similar to like the B-24, B-29 squadron does, or do you just mainly concentrate on the local area and, and air shows? Uh, we concentrate on air shows um, in the Midwest. Um, the touring is, is certainly something, and I think every unit's probably the same way. Um, uh, how do we figure out the tour, uh, that that process? How do we figure out the tour economics? And and we're um, we're, continually trying to experiment with that and get out and see if, whether we join up with the air power tour or with one of the other tours or with one of the airplanes. Um, we have talked about, do we have an opportunity to meet them regionally uh, do, as they come through? Can we join for a show or two or can we join for a weekend? Uh, so yes, we are uh, something very much on our radars that we're trying to do as, as we expand out uh, uh, in addition to our normal show schedule, which is the out and back uh, weekend air shows. Sure. Well, part of why we're doing this is not only to spotlight the Missouri wing, but also to talk about uh, the, the the paint uh, paint job that's going on on the airplane right now. And right. It, it's funny because when you and I first talked about uh, doing this show, um, it was like, well, let's wait until April because I think it'll be out of the paint shop by then. But um, not quite, but we've got some pictures we'll show you Not in a little quite. bit. <laughs> like all well, things you're playing, it it's always it takes is. longer with, than you think it's going to, right? <laughs> it does. It, with any event, the first three quarters yep. tend to run pretty smoothly, and the last quarter is just a a, a show. So yep. we are in the last quarter now, and and we're struggling through the 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 punch list and and the final items down there. But hopefully, early next week, it'll be back. Um, the paint project, uh, we really started on it probably two years ago, uh, okay. looking into paint. Uh, the, it was painted by Boeing here in St. Louis in the 1990s. The paint job has held up great, um, but you begin to see the wear on top of the wings and where it's going. So it, it's not only a, a, a appearance issue, but it's a preservation issue. And it's, it's a matter of um, keeping keeping the airplane running and keeping it going. Now, we again, we're fortunate that we have the our, our, um, our, our sponsor and our supporter to be able to do this. So it took two years. Uh, the airplane went into the paint shop last um, October, uh, October, November. Uh, it is down at uh, Hangar 360 in Clinton, uh, Mississippi. So as you can imagine, the airplane got in there, First thing they had to do is all the flight controls come off because you remember the flight controls on the bomber are uh, fabric. And so those got sent off uh, to Don Wade's operation. And then they begin uh, uh, with hangar, uh, the Hangar 360 folks down there and stripping the airplane. So I, I reached out to uh, Pat Fenwick, our maintenance officer today, and I said, just give me a few fun facts here that I can pass on about the paint job. So he told me that uh, uh, when it got in there, uh, there were 75 gallons of stripper uh, that they used on the airplane to get it off. So the last time it was painted, it was sanded, but not stripped. So probably three coats of paint on the airplane. So 75 gallons of stripper, and you can see from the picture, 
the the uh, flaps were taken off, the bomb bay doors were taken off, uh, and of course the flight controls that were going out to to be recovered were taken off. Uh, so it used 75 gallons of stripper. There were five people that stripped and sanded the airplane for a couple of weeks to get it all down there. And then uh, there were three painters and two mechanics who joined in the paint. Now the paint was all done uh, with cup guns, so there weren't pressure uh, painters on there. So they started off and uh, started with two gallons of corrosion protection on the airplane. We had uh, five gallons of epoxy primer, five gallons of the green color and two gallons of the gray. Uh, so that's what it took to paint it uh, when we got up there. Um, the interesting thing on the flight controls is a lot of people are used to fabric flight controls that are stitched. And these flight controls were originally, uh, they used just, I don't like thousands of screws. They weren't stitched, they, the fabric was screwed on. Uh, when they redid these controls, they actually used rivets instead of the screws. So that saved quite a bit of on there. So these went out to Don Wade. We were very fortunate. We, we didn't find a lot of corrosion uh, on the flight controls. So they were recovered and sent back um, to be rehung on the airplane. Uh, we The paint job had to be coordinated with the return of the flight controls because you can see on the Apache on the tail, uh, part of the Apache is on the rudder and part is on the vertical stab. So we had to get that back installed before they could finish that paint. Uh, so they've been through um, all the decals and all the lettering were put back on. Um, they were able to protect the nose art, which was a real concern. And as we talked about earlier, that blue border around her allowed them to get in to feather that new paint in without getting into the, um, into the, the nose art itself. So they replaced all that. And you can see the show me is in a little different stylus on there. And um, we caught up with the, the bombs represent the number of years the unit has had the airplane. And as I mentioned earlier, the stars were the times when it attended the Dulo reunions. So it was a, a, a long process and they, um, they have um, down at Hangar 360, which is also John's 360, John Mosley, um, his son now, uh, uh, Daniel is running it. But they developed a, they were also in the uh, auto body business and they developed a ceramic coating to use on boats and cars and airplanes. So the last step that they just finished up is this has had a ceramic coating put on now that um, will really help with the oil and the dirt. Uh, and, and we have a kit that we can reapply occasionally to, to um, help support the ceramic coating and so that should go a long way toward keeping it, uh, keeping looking good for all well, the next, you know, 20 years. So um, it, it's been a great process. It's, it's, uh, we're looking forward to getting it back. Um, but they did, they did a great job on it down there. And he, he, uh, down there at uh, Hangar 360, they're, they're known for their warbird painting and uh, other warbirds in the hangar along with ours. And uh, ours took up a lot of room, so I'm sure they'll be happy to, to get us out of there and 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 get on to other projects, but we're really looking forward to getting it back and uh, showing off the new paint job to everyone. Yeah. Well, and if you look at the 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 nose art here, uh, if you saw some of the earlier pictures, of course there was that blue border that went around uh, the, the pinup girl, and they've it, it's gone now. It's they've they've been able to blend that right in. It looks like it's brand new uh, nose art. They did, yeah, and it was, you know, our concern, you know, when the airplane, before it went to paint, uh, you know, the standing rule was, you don't get near that nose art with any kind of cleaner, anything, nothing. Uh, we'll we'll clean up with a little water if we have to. So that was, of course, a, a big concern when we took it down there, was protecting that nose art uh, and that work that Gary had done just a couple of years ago uh, to, to be able to bring that back, so. Now, when, when Gary did redid the nose art a few years ago and he put that border around there, what, were you thinking at that time that you might be looking at a new paint job in the future? We had been talking about it, and I, and, um, I think that was his effort to help us prepare for that. Uh, I don't want to put you know, thoughts in his, in his mind, but uh, we had talked about it. And, and of course, he knew uh, it, was, it was getting to the point where it was getting close where we needed to start 
uh, looking at it. And it the the paint, like, as I mentioned earlier, the paint held up very well, but it was just getting into spots where it was starting to show. And and from a, a strictly a preservation standpoint, we wanted to make sure that we we took good care of the airplane going forward. Good. Any idea how much uh, how much uh, the airplane weighed with no paint compared to with paint? We haven't weighed it yet. So as soon as it comes home, that's going to be, of course, you know, kind of standard when you uh, weigh, when you paint an airplane, we need to reweigh it. Yeah. Uh, we're hoping it shows up, it's got less paint on it. So we're hoping that it, sure. uh, it, it, it shows up a little lighter. As you well know, airplanes never get lighter. They only get heavier yep. uh, as time goes on, but hopefully it'll be a little bit lighter. So uh, you can see from this picture, uh, as this is when the base was done and then they begin to put all the stenciling on and all the decals in, uh, that was a real time consuming effort because there's a lot of little, you know, TO arters on the airplane and, 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 and data spots on the airplane that they need to. So um, hopefully it comes in lighter whenever we'll see, we'll see next week. <laughs> oh, there we go. Now we were, we were talking uh, before you came on the air, um, there was actually when Boeing did the the uh, repaint previously, as you've mentioned, they did a, a great job at it. But they had gone to a Vietnam uh, palette rather than the original World War II palette, and you've you've kind of tried to go back. Well, let's talk about the, that. And and yeah. and uh, uh, a couple of guys in the unit, Gary Chambers and some other guys who are real, um, they're kind of a aficionados of this. But they it was the gray and the out in the uh, uh, the OD were, as we understand it, part of a palette from the Vietnam era and paint that uh, Boeing was able to get readily. And when we came down to this paint job, I know that Pat and, and Mike and some of the guys in the unit had, had and, and Gary had, had tried to look back to see how close we were to the palette that existed then. So the shades are a little different. The uh, gray on the belly is a, a, a tad shade darker than the earlier one, but very close to what it was. So uh, not a lot of change, um, certainly to the casual observer. If people who come out and see Show Me every once in a while, they won't notice a difference. But the the, the real nitpicky guys will say, "Yeah, a little different, a little little darker here." Uh, but uh, we're we're very pleased with the way it turned out. It looks good in the uh, in the sunlight as well. It does, and you can see the parts still off, and you know we're missing yep. rudders and we're missing ailerons, and and uh, so they they've spent the last week here getting all the flight controls reconnected and 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 going through, and hopefully, actually tomorrow uh, we're looking for a little better weather down in Mississippi, so we're gonna get it out and run it tomorrow, and um, and uh, hopefully we'll be on track to bring it home early next week. So good. Where is the uh, the first first place that it will uh, hopefully uh, be on public display? Aside from at the Missouri so Bay Hangar, our first one uh, will be the 27th of this month. We have an event at our airport here in St. Louis. There's a, a big car show, so a wings and wheels show, and hopefully we'll be showing the airplane and, and doing some rides there. And uh, we also have a, a flyover of a big Scott Jamboree coming up over in Illinois that weekend too. So. That'll be the first one. Then we'll move into the uh, Wings Over St. Louis um, as we get into May, and then uh, you know dive full full bore into the air show season. So good, good. And uh, uh, as always, there needs to be a recruitment poster. <laughs> there is. That's Matt Conrad. We uh, we want you. We want to. We're looking for always looking for help. Right. The uh, uh, the recruitment of volunteers is is one of the things that uh, show me is very good at. So yeah, that's a great picture of Matt. Yeah. Uh, we want we want you on this, so. <laughs> that's good. If uh, people want to keep up with the, with the wing, um, obviously you've got a website, Facebook page, right? Right, uh, cafmo.org. And we are on Facebook under the Commemorative Air Force uh, Missouri Wing as well. Um, so they can keep up with us there, follow on the schedule and um, uh, of course, we have the ability to buy rides on there and to uh, uh, reserve your seat on board, either Show Me or the TVM or the Stearman. So you um, you're all, all right, out there for, are for the for the season. So all right, uh, Richard is is wondering if uh, you can kind of talk about the flying characteristics of the of the 25. Is it like a truck? Is it more responsive, like a car? 
heavier light it on is the more responsive. Yeah, it, it, it's a for a big airplane, a relatively big airplane that it is, it, it's it's fairly light on the controls. Uh, it's very light in roll um, and in pitch. It's 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 very manageable. So uh, again, I'm uh, still relative to the airplane. Uh, the guys that have been flying it for you know 15 or 20 years may disagree with me, but I I found it to be fairly light uh, in, in the handling. Uh, it it it's a very honest airplane on takeoff and landing. Um, it, it it doesn't have the the single engine characteristics are very manageable in the airplane. Um, so it, uh, early in the airplane, they they experimented with a number of configurations of the tail before they ended up with the um, the tail section that we're used to now, where both vertical stabilizers are in line with each engine, um, which helps a lot. Um, in uh, single engine situations, but the airplane uh, seems very, uh, very easy to fly. So it can be a bit handful on a runway occasionally, and but uh, it's just a, you know a matter of flying the airplane. So there you go. And Richard's also wondering if you could do a uh, a barrel roll and still recover. Um, I suspect somebody's probably tried it, but no, we haven't. <laughs> Uh, it's maybe a little too much stress for a 70 plus year old airplane. Yeah, we, we would take care of it. So there you go. And he also mentions that it was flown in Canada by the uh, RCAF uh, until the mid 60s. So yeah, long, yeah it was long, long so, service. So no, Richard, we haven't tried that, but you know, we like <laughs> the way you think. So <laughs> well, and, and uh, in thinking about it, the, the airplane itself too was uh, relatively I guess groundbreaking to, to come out with a, a twin engine uh, air, airplane early in World War II that had a tricycle landing gear. Everything else was conventional or as we call tail dragger these days. It did. And it was, you know, it, and I, I, I know we, we touched on this earlier, but if you think about, and I, and I always go back to the marvel of what they were able to do in 1942. The airplane, I think I read where it has 168,000 parts uh, plus 150,000 rivets in it. And to be able to accomplish that, as we talked about, to bring an airplane off the assembly line 10 times, you know, 10 in a day is, is an amazing feat. And this was done with slide rolls and done on paper. And we think of our modern CAD CAM and the way that we design airplanes. It's, it's a marvelous feat. And um, to not have a test program and to essentially develop the airplane as it was being produced uh, is, is quite a tribute and it's, uh, uh, we were, we were fortunate enough a year ago, uh, years ago, a few years ago to be at an air show and, um, we got to meet a lady that, uh, worked in a plant in Fairfax and she, she said, I can probably show you where I, where I built, you know, did the riveting on this airplane. Sure. And so to be able to make that connection between somebody that actually bucked the rivets on an airplane back in, in 1944. And you know to have her on the ramp next to the airplane today that was quite special, uh, amongst a million special moments you get out on when you're out on the airplane. Well, good. Uh, just a couple of minutes left. Any any final thoughts before we wrap up tonight? Well, I I would I would say that um, you know we're very appreciative of this opportunity to show the airplane and the CAF um, it has been such a, a a benefit to me having retired from flying and found the CAF. But there's there's nothing nothing that beats having the airplane out and getting to meet on those occasions you get to meet somebody that flew the airplane and and somebody that you know we can help somebody up in the airplane that flew it and we just stand back and let them have their moment but we're all in that moment with them and it's they're they're magical moments when you get to meet these people and as we said there's nothing like being able to touch touch metal hear the sounds, see the sounds, to be able to tell the story and, and, and keep alive, you know, the stories that we're trying to tell here. So it's a, it's a great tool for it. And the CAF and all the other Warbird operators, but especially the CAF, excel at doing that and, and keeping that alive. So it's a great honor to be able to do it. And we are, we're, we, we're, we're privileged to fly the airplane. We're privileged to be able to show the airplane. And we appreciate the opportunity to be able to do that. So Good. And once again, if people want to keep track of, of the activities of the airplanes, um, maybe make a donation or uh, contribute their time or talents, uh, how's the best way to do that? 
best way is CAFMO. Uh, even the only better way would be to please come out and see us. Uh, if you're in St. Louis, take the time to come out to Smart Field and see us. Uh, our normal days out there are Thursdays and Saturdays, but we're always around for, for tours and for events. And uh, not in addition to the uh, two hangars, uh, we have a, a really nice museum out there that uh, uh, our docents have done a great job organizing the museum. The museum follows, it changes on a yearly basis from what happened in 43 to 44 to 45. And uh, so it changes out quite frequently. So you won't see the same thing uh, when you come out that you saw last year that you get to see when you come out this year. So come All see right. us and come join us out there. And if not, we'll see you at the air shows. Sounds good. Rob, thanks for uh, for being a part of our uh, our show tonight, and uh, it's going to wrap things up. Uh, please remember to like and share and subscribe to our uh, Warbur Tube videos. And again, if you uh, are on YouTube, click that bell icon. You'll get notifications of new episodes uh, when they're posted. Now, we do value your input. If you have any feedback on this show or any of our previous shows or ideas for something you'd like to see us cover in an upcoming show, just send Leah Block an email at uh, media at cafhq.org. Until next time, I'm Steve Buss. Have a great night.